This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. It is 1851, New York, New York society. A young man, Peter, meets a young woman, Mary, and therein lies the tale. The book is Strong Passions, a scandalous divorce in old New York. Barbara Weisberg is the author. I welcome her and congratulate and say at the same time, Peter meets Mary seems a perfect match. We will follow both. These are children of very prominent families. Mary is a Stevens. Peter is a strong. We'll follow Mary first because of her father, John Austin Stevens, is a prominent banker in 1851. Peter meets her in 1851. He's enamored by 1852, and they're married by 1853. What do we need to know about Mary's family? Good evening to you, Barbara. Good evening, John. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. Mary's family, they are exceedingly well-to-do. They are prominent New Yorkers. Her father is, in fact, one of the leading bankers in the country. They are a very cosmopolitan family. They live right in the heart of New York, but there are some things about them that feel very 19th century. Notably, uh, Abby has one brother and uh, seven sisters. Um, her mother had, I think it was 12 children and nine of them survived. And it was not unusual at the time for families to have very many children because their birth control was found, uh, frowned upon and there, there really were no reliable methods. So it was a family that was very sophisticated, uh, very cosmopolitan, very loving and close. Um, and Mary was supposed to be a wonderful conversationalist, which was something valued at the time. And she was supposed to be very beautiful. And unlike some girls of her age, she had wanted to go on to school beyond her 16th birthday, and she had done that. So she was educated, right, and met this handsome young man who had just returned from an exciting European trip, and they fell in love. And courted for perhaps a year, um, Mary's parents felt she was too young to marry. She was about 19 at the time, and Peter was about 29. And Mary had, Mary had an older sister, Lucretia, whom she's close to. Mary's a middle child. Indeed. Lucretia, did Lucretia bless this romance? She thought that Peter was a devoted beau, and she liked him very much. So, in fact, she was one of the bridesmaids at the wedding. Peter had gone finally to ask permission to marry Mary from her father, John Austin Stevens, the banker. And he promised John Austin Stevens that he had an allowance from his family on which he could support Mary and But Peter came away with the notion that John Austin Stevens had also promised to contribute quite a good allowance to help the young married couple. But they were in love. They had a wonderful wedding at Mary's home with friends and relatives. And on Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. And it was considered really a storybook marriage because they both came from the same social class. They were upper middle class, upper upper class New Yorkers, part of part of New York's elite social circles. And they honeymooned Philadelphia. And, and they went to Philadelphia. They uh, Philadelphia at the time, I think, was about five or six hours by train from New York. And it was a place that was very attractive because, of course, it was the cradle of liberty and there were museums and 
it was it was considered a wonderful place to visit. Their first child, Mamie, Mary, Mamie, is born a little more than a year later, and the pregnancy goes forward, and they now have a child. They're a perfect couple to be envied by all of New York. Peter, Peter is a strong. His father died tragically in 1838 when Peter was 15 years old. And you begin that tale by saying a runaway horse and this very prominent businessman is dead. What did that mean for Peter's mother, Aletta? Well, Aletta also had a good number of children, not nine, I think it was six. Peter, like Mary, was a middle child. Aletta had money and property of her own. She um, was was the heir to a wealthy Long Island family and had an estate in Queens. When her husband died, Aletta picked up her children and moved them all to this estate in Queens. So they had been an urban family. Now they're really, Queens is quite rural at the time. The estate is quite beautiful, sprawling, affluent, but they are all moved out of the city. This is Aletta's wish. The children go with her. They're not totally isolated. Peter is able to go back and forth to the city and actually attends Columbia County and becomes something of a young man about town uh, and apprentices as a lawyer. So they Peter, to some degree, lives a bit in two worlds before he marries Mary. He, he, he belongs to the estate in Queens, which is called Waverly, and lives there with his mother and his siblings and the sibling spouses. But he also has a law office in New York. He never really practices, but it's considered prestigious to call yourself a lawyer. Peter basically takes care of his mother's properties and he fancies himself a writer and a poet and uh, just aspires to a more literary career than he's able to, in the end, manage. He's well regarded by his friends. He's considered a, a good companion. He's well-educated. He celebrates the poets, Keats, for example. He likes the romantic painters, a recognizable gentleman. He doesn't really work. He manages his mother's estate. There's one codicil on the deceased father that the allowance per year, 4,000, which you translate into 130,000 today for Peter. Yes. That, that is contingent upon the, the children all staying close by Aletta which is that part of an explanation for why they all live there? It's like Dallas, you know, all the, all the children live there with their wives. Yes. All the children, uh, the, the children and their children, I think in large part, it did have to do with the provisions of the father's will. Although again, they were a very close family and, 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 and the estate was large and comfortable, but, but they all lived in the house at Waverly. Uh, it wasn't that it was a compound where they had separate cottages or anything. But yes, the father's will said they should all remain close to their mother during her lifetime. And they basically took that quite literally. One of the daughters actually married a bishop in New York. Uh, he wasn't a bishop then. He was a minister at one of New York's more prestigious churches and she lived at the parish house in Manhattan, but she went back and forth to Queens to visit her mother and siblings in Waverly so often that she might as well have lived there too. That's Julia, the oldest. Uh, the That's oldest. Julia. Right. So uh, Peter took Mary home post the honeymoon to Waverly and lived there with her. And so Mary was quite a distance from her own family and from the metropolitan world she'd grown up in and, and loved and from some of her own friends. As you can tell, we're setting up an explosion. 
that's not hard where we're headed. But this is everything you'd want in a family. It's it's beyond life with father. It's <laughs> life, it's it's life with family. The Strongs and the Stevens. These are part of the legend of New York that will be written about and will come to it because Edith Wharton descends from these families. Will be written about at the turn of the century. But this is the years from 1850 to crash into the Civil War, brother versus brother. And when we come back, we're going to go to Waverly and Mary's years as the wife of one of the sons living under the roof of her mother-in-law. Barbara Weisberg is the author. The book is Strong Passions, A Scandalous Divorce in Old New York. Mary and Peter, they come home to Waverly. Mamie is born, their child in 1854. And now they're living in the country, not isolated. The family is overrun with servants. There's many horses. There are lots of carriages. They're extremely well-to-do. Mary's family, the Stevens, are in Manhattan, and father gets more and more prominent so that Mary consoles him in the great panic of 1857. She's a strong side, a strong daughter to John Austin Stevens. In this meantime, Mary's going through births and miscarriages. I... Barbara, forgive me if I don't have the chronology right, but the Mamie is born in 54. There's a miscarriage in 55. They go overseas for two or three years, traveling Genoa, Rome, prominent family, visiting other prominent families. And then there's another miscarriage in 57. I believe whether it happens overseas or coming home, but none of this is unusual uh, to your re very careful research. The marriages substantive and supportive and and busy in these years. Is that correct, Barbara? So it seems, indeed, with one caveat, Mary is almost from the beginning restless living at Waverly. She always longed for a home of her own. She'd grown up with eight siblings and here she was again in a crowded household only now they weren't even her siblings they were her in-laws and and for a young woman of her social class it would have been probably uh she felt more appropriate to have a home of her own with her husband and to start a family there. It didn't even need to be a, an expensive home, could have been a modest home, but her own home rather than living with all of her in-laws. Apart from that, and she apparently had made that quite clear to Peter, um, they seemed to be happy, they seemed to be loving, and again, they were well-matched in education and both seem to be sociable and genial young people. Another daughter is born, Allie. And then these are the years building up to the Civil War. And Barbara is very careful to give us the chronology around these families. The building, the building storm that we know so well with Lincoln's election in the fall of 60. And then the war breaks out in 61. However, there's a war breaking out in Waverly, we need to describe some of the conditions here. Mary has a miscarriage. She has a child, and then she has another child, Elizabeth, born in 60. But that leaves Mary very exhausted, fragile even. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. She seemed after Edith's birth. Uh, in October of 1860, she seems depressed, frail. She faints on occasion, which is not so unusual for a woman of the time because their clothes were so tight they couldn't breathe. But nevertheless, she seems unwell. And Peter actually rents a home for them first uh, in the resort town of Lenox, where their little family can be on their own, and then actually rents a home in New York City for them. 
So at last, unwell, unhappy, Mary does get a home of her own, although it's rented, and she knows that she's probably going to wind up going back to Waverly. Here comes the, the, the revelation. Peter has an older brother, Edward. The war starts in April of 61. Edward is going to uh, volunteer, going to volunteer into a volunteer regiment and go to war. He's the only one of the brothers, to my reading, who does. Remember, the well-to-do had an ability to buy themselves out of the draft by 63, but early on, everybody thought the war will be over for, over for Christmas. So there was not a lot of volunteering in 61, but by 62, there was. Uh, Lincoln put up a draft. However, what we need to pay attention to is Mary's condition and her older brother, Edward, who has married a 17-year-old beauty, Susan Warren, who dies, I believe, in 59, but in any event, Mary, Susan is dead and Edward is bereft. And now we come to the difficult to conceive part, but it's there. Edward and Mary, one night in a drawing room or somewhere in Waverly, I'm imagining this, Barbara, their hands touch. And what does Mary say? Well, Mary subsequently says that the touch ignited fire in her heart. And that at that point, an affair begins with Edward. Now, Peter, this is obviously secret. Peter knows nothing of this. Mary, finally, both Peter and Mary are devoted to their children. And shortly after, well, when Edward is ready to go to war, and we are looking at the winter of 61, just about Christmas. Mary's youngest daughter, she's only about a year old, becomes very ill. Edward is, is in the house, but he goes, he's there on furlough. He goes back to the war and little baby Edith, attended by both her parents who adore her dies. It's now January 1862. When we come back, Strong Passions, A Scandalous Divorce in Old New York. Barbara Weisberg is the author. Edward's gone to war. Mary and Peter now mourn the death of their daughter. January 2nd, there's a notice in the newspapers that Elizabeth is gone. Mamie and Ellie are healthy, but Elizabeth is gone. In their grief, they console each other. And then, Barbara... Mary comes forward to Peter and tells him what? She hurls herself at his feet and says, you can't imagine how guilty I have been. For the last 18 months, I've been having an affair with Edward, your brother. And Peter is, of course, stunned, horrified, grief-stricken. A few weeks later, he meets with his father-in-law, the distinguished banker, John Austin Stevens, uh, who, and tells John Austin Stevens, John Austin Stevens doesn't believe it. He says, you're making this up. You're just so heart sick about the death of your daughter. You're, you've gone a little crazy. And Peter says, talk to Mary. She'll tell you the truth. And so John Austin Stevens meets with Mary and as he later will say, Mary says to him, it's true, Father, every word. Now, there's one more, I don't know, if, <laughs> there is one more catch here, which is shortly after Mary confesses to Peter that she's been having an affair with Edward, she also tells Peter that she is pregnant. And whose baby is it? Unclear. And this Edward, Edward's at war. Edward's in a uh, uh, the aide to a general Burnside expedition. Edward then continues to volunteer for roles. We have Edward off scene. We're not going to get to him. He won't be home but mutt for an hour in these next years, and eventually will be alienated from his own family. 
So Edward becomes an idea. At the same time, Barbara and I were speaking and I said, Barbara, it came to me as I'm reading your book. I don't know how this is gonna come out, but this is brother versus brother. This is the atmosphere of the war in two families who are at this point paralyzed with the revelations that have come to them and society is not ready to hear it. Is that correct, Barbara? Absolutely correct. Uh, it it really is something of a of a metaphor for the war or the war in microcosm. It is brother against brother. It is complete sense of of betrayal, as as Peter now, totally distraught and enraged, moves toward divorcing Mary finally, and divorce among the upper class in New York. Divorce is rare among anybody at this time, but among the upper classes in New York, it is absolutely taboo. You can't do it. You can secretly separate, you can make a private settlement, but you cannot go to divorce or go to court and divorce without absolute disdain from everyone you know in your social circle. And right. it's hard to get divorce. Very hard. Now there's time here. From January of 62, the war is tearing the country apart. The grief is everywhere. People are in black all the time. The church services are filled with it. However, Peter and Mary are trying to find a way to continue to live under mother-in-law's roof, to raise their two healthy children, and to stay apart. And Peter uh, goes along with this. John, St uh, John Austin Stevens goes along with this. Papa, Peter's father, is gone. So there's one senior figure in the in the combined family, two senior females and one senior male. And for 62, 63, 64, they carry on until they can't anymore. And that's when the lawyers enter. Now, Barbara teaches that divorce, she says it's hard. There are mitigations that are obvious all around you that would prevent the divorce from being granted. And we've, Barbara, we see them all connivance and collusion. In other words, did Peter permit this to happen in his house? See his brother uh, carrying on with his wife. How could he miss it, you would ask? Also, forgiveness. Peter does forgive her in his way. and uh, But he tries to find a way to live side by side with her. That, if proved in court, would end the divorce. Uh, reconciliation. You could argue strangely they're not reconciled, but they're living on the third floor. Let's do the housing. There's a bed. There's a big bedroom with rosewood furniture. Where's Peter's room? Nearby. Actually, Peter's room, yeah, is is down the hall. Wherever it is that these they're living at the time, because they actually do have to move around. They eventually move out of Waverly. They rent another house. They rent in another house, but wherever they are at this point, and they're still trying to put on the semblance of a marriage, they have separate bedrooms. Not far. They're, you know, maybe down a hall, but absolutely they do not share a bedroom. And that becomes an issue down the line. The law, the courts begin November of 65. The war is over with, but the, the, the country is still burning. And all around them, they go into a courtroom, which Barbara presents as one of the one of the premier courtrooms of Manhattan at the time in the new civil uh, uh, in the new building. Is that is it Tweed's building that they're in that the courtroom? No, Tweed is at the time actually starting the new building, but they're still stuck in what was the old taxation building. And the newspapers would say that when people went to trial in that building, if it was tax time, the judges would be knocked down the stairs by people running around trying to pay their taxes. So they were in an old building, but the glorious new building was in process. This is one of the joys of the book. The two law teams hired by the Stevens and Strongs are magnif magnificent characters, all charismatic. Just a name, Barbara has great 
great joy in quoting, quoting the testimony and the presentation by Henry Cram, the lead attorney for Peter, who's the plaintiff, and uh, John McCain, John McKean, and John Graham are the defendant attorneys. They make these magnificent speeches. As I'm reading them, I'm I keep getting convinced by them, and they're completely 180 degrees opposite. However, part of the allegation, and we're not going to give it away because you need to follow this story carefully, like a novel. Part of the allegation is that Peter's been alienated and he needs a divorce. But what triggers this is Mamie's living with Peter and Ali's living with Mary and Peter wants them both. Is that his idea or is that his mother's idea? Where does that come from? Because he's, he's disordering what looks to be equilibrium. It. It comes from two play. It comes from Peter. Part of it is just he, 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 he tries to forgive. God bless him, but he's enraged. And in America at the time, it's considered the father's patriarchal right to have his children. And the angrier Peter gets over the years at Mary over for a whole slew of reasons, the more it strikes him that he should have control and custody of his children, not only because in his mind, Mary's in the wrong, she had an affair with his brother, but also because it's a father's patriarchal right. Fathers get custody of their children, not mothers. And he wants both daughters. And good for John Austin Stevens, and Austin Stevens, his son, because they won't give Mary up. They fight for her. Mary, in the meantime, has fled the country. What a surprise. <laughs> it's taken, taken Allie with her. Boy, does this, boy, is this tense now. All right, now, the, the witness list for the plaintiff. And I thought I'd wandered into Canterbury Tales. Here comes the bishop wife. Here comes the chambermaid. Here comes the, the, the groom. Uh, here comes the house, uh, the uh, governess. They all have different points of view of the affair. Uh, and it spills out in a courtroom that also spills out in the national newspapers in New York and across the country. It ebbed and flowed, though, didn't it, Barbara, the, the attention to this? Because there's drama going on. They are impeaching. They are thinking of impeaching Andrew Johnson, that the first impeachment failed as well as all the other impeachments, but they are thinking about it. And uh, reconstruction is underway. The Klan is riding in the South. The army's occupying the South. All that's going on around them. And Strong versus Strong, did they cover it every day? How, how do the newspapers present it, Barbara? It was covered every day. Uh, it's a five-week trial, but the reporter's interest ebbed and flowed when there were long depositions that were read because people didn't show up. The reporters were bored when there were actual witnesses on the stand telling their story. Then the newspapers were really interested and they would, um, everybody would show up and it would get columns on the front page. So it depended on it depended on how distracted they were by the major news going on in the country, but also who was testifying and how it was, how, whether it was live or, or the reading of a deposition, which seemed to have bored everybody. Nobody yes. liked that. The last witness is Robert Roosevelt, who is uh, related directly to Theodore Roosevelt, who's seven years old at the time. Robert Roosevelt is 36 years old and a cousin who it becomes important in terms of conservation. And Barbara reasons quite quite convincingly that this is the, the predicate for Theodore Roosevelt's fascination with national parks and with preserving the wildlife out of this trial. But we're not going to tell you the end, are we, Barbara? No, no, <laughs> because it's, it's unguessable. We're going to go to someone who learned a deal, we believe, from these events and became world famous, still is, the novelist Edith Wharton. The book is Strong Passions, A Scandalous Divorce in Old New York. Barbara Weisberg is the author. 
We're not telling the ending on purpose because you can't guess it, but we are going to go to the next generation. Edith Wharton is a Stevens. Is that correct, Barbara? That is correct. Uh, she, she is a cousin of uh, Mary's, let me see. She is, Edith Wharton's mother is a cousin of Mary's. So they know this story in old New York, the Stevens, the Astors, the Strongs, uh, all the Joneses keeping up with the Joneses, Edith Wharton's a Jones as well. All everybody knows this story and everybody knows that it became impossible for the two to stay together and they were separate apart. And Barbara guides me to a short story that Edith Wharton wrote about Miss Mrs. Lidcote coming home from Europe uh, to attend or to bless or in some way to visit her daughter, Leela, who has divorced her husband and is now carrying on or remarried a new man. And what is striking about the revelations in this book to me, Barbara, is that this is the period in the Gilded Age in which divorce became commonplace. It had been extremely rare and difficult beforehand, before the war. And afterwards, it explodes in New York. I think you said it went up 80% in 10 years. Do I remember that correctly? Yes. Between 1870 and 1880, by some accounts, it went up by some 80%. Still small number because it started out so small, but it was a, 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 a noticeable obvious, impact increase. Now, there are a lot of outrages about the way women have been treated in this country. I understand that. I mean, no vote, uh, no witness, uh, no presenting witnesses, no money, your dowry goes away from you. But the one that I didn't know about that seems most amazing is that in a divorce, when adultery or fault is fixed, it must be fixed. This is the time of no fault. The party that is judged guilty cannot remarry until the other one's dead. True. Yes. I, I, I immediately it occurred to me, how do the heck are they, they going to enforce that? What do they have around divorce police? There was actually, my understanding is, and I don't fully understand this, but that there was more bigamy around than one, one would countenance today. And I will say, I am not sure that that was always the ruling, but it was generally the ruling that the guilty party was forbidden to remarry until the innocent party's death. Then what we have here, I'm looking for a silver lining because the war is such a tragedy. What we have here is, is an example of what wasn't working and that the, we might see that in some fashion, this was a, this was a, a demonstration to society that your your walls have to come down, that you're that you're not taking into account human nature, and that uh, the divorce court is for everyone, not just for the people who can, who are the rich people who can throw their elbows around. I'm 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 trying to find something positive about this, Barbara, because you've written, unlike a novel where you have to have verisimilitude. The wonderful thing about about history is you can't believe it, except that it happens. I will say that I won't call it a happy ending, but that for the people involved, to some extent, it winds up that there is a satisfactory ending that alleviates some of the tragedy. And that in having this news about this really horrific divorce struggle broadcast across all the newspapers, you open up um, a world that hadn't been visible before, the world of the upper class, the privacy, the secrets, the... And people begin to see that 
in a certain way, the rich are no different from you and me. They are flawed. And that's something we know today. Today, the rich and famous are all over the newspaper for their foibles. Back then, they were hidden. And now everybody knew that scandal haunted them as well as the regular folk. Barbara's window is the diary of George Templeton Strong, 1835 to 1875. I think I have that correct. Who was he, Barbara? He was a lawyer and uh, a very prominent New Yorker who worked hard for the Union cause. And what he is most often remembered for is he kept a diary every day of his life from 1835 to 1875. And it is perhaps one of the most extraordinary recountings of what goes on in 19th century New York and 19th century America that scholars have. And almost anything you read about 19th century New York will quote George Templeton Strong in some context because he is a window on everything that is happening from the political to the day-to-day. -day. Strong, other... strong versus strong is in there. The, the, the trial, the divorce, the tragedy, it's all there. We have just a few seconds. That's where I discovered it. He is a cousin of Peter Strong, just about the same age. And he is the one who first writes about this terrible divorce. The book is Strong Passions, highly recommended. I understand this is a lot of grief that's going on, but you will. There are moments that you will. You must laugh. A scandalous divorce in old New York. Barbara Weisberg is the author. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor.